painter, sculptor, photographer, and educator. This artist has studied and taught art in New York City, Venezuela, and here in Illinois. Her art centers around the inspiration to be found in the natural landscape, weathered surfaces, and her pursuit of the ephemeral through mark making. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Christina Nordholm. Welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk with artists whose work is part of our community. I'm John Morrison, and I'll be your host. Our guest today is Christina Nordholm. She received her BA degree from Yale University, where she studied painting, sculpture, art history, and education. Her MFA degree in sculpture is from Illinois State University. Her work has been exhibited in many venues, including New York City and Chicago. She has lived here in Urbana for the past 20 years. Christina, thanks for agreeing to talk with us today. Certainly. What can you tell us about what led you to choose the life of an artist? Well, I don't know about the life of an artist, but being an artist, I definitely didn't even choose. It just sort of was how I was nurtured. My mother was artistic, my father was artistic, and I grew up in an atmosphere of access to materials and encouragement. My parents' uh, favorite act, family activity, aside from sailing, was amateur theater. So my brother and I were put to work very early learning how to paint bricks and straighten nails to be reused in set right. building. And um, I just never had a life without art. I thought of myself as an artist from about the age of four. I can think I declared it. And I can remember in second grade being asked by my first grade teacher to come back and uh, teach art classes, which of course I thought was the cat's meow at that time. Right. So I'm guessing there was never a plan B. It was always art all the way. Well, the plan was always A, but the reality was always B. I see. You have to do an awful lot of things to support your life as an artist. Right, I understand that. Um, did you encounter any uh, noteworthy mentors along the way that you might want to mention besides your parents? Well, early on, uh, I got a scholarship uh, to go to Saturday classes at the Dayton Art Institute, and I was little at that time, but I learned figure drawing and I was very impressed by the museum itself. Walking down the halls on my way to class on a Saturday was just an enthralling experience and an opportunity to come up close and actually study the way things were being made. And that juxtaposition uh, against my own efforts to try to make an ear look like an ear and seeing what had been accomplished sort of set the, set the, the standard pretty high for accomplishment. And I, in terms of Mentors along the way, I would say um, later on I moved to New York City and uh, I worked with some book designers and they were also very encouraging of my work and they gave me my first set of pastels, which was, you know, a hundred, uh, several hundred dollars worth of, of artistic material. And at that time I was mostly working on typing paper, so it was a real step up to be given pastels, but again an endorsement from professional people who were established in their career and having them recognize uh, what they believed to be my talent was very heartening and confirming. So right. I owe them a, a debt of gratitude. And then later going to school, of course, there were people I met in school who influenced me. And the people I met, I mean, I lived a, a life in New York City of both being an artist and being a model and selling art and doing every possible ver variation on the theme of being involved with the art world. And of course, everybody you touch when you're hungry for learning right. is someone who feeds your soul in some way. Right. Well, you mentioned New York City and uh, you said that you lived there for more than 15 years. Is there anything that stands out in your mind about that period of, of your life that you might like to share? Uh, any good New York stories? 
worth relating to us. Um, did you happen to run into Woody Allen while you were out there, for example? Woody Allen. Uh, <laughs> only in passing. I did spend a summer in Paul Simon's apartment. Well. But, uh, and I used to see Andy Warhol at clubs, but that was later on in life. When I first moved to New York City, I was just 16 and took classes at the Art Students League and would find canvases on the street and people would give me paints and paper. And I loved the abundance of New York City. The detritus in New York is is richer than the things you can find in a, in a Michael's in Champaign-Urbana. <laughs> right, right. What years, uh, what period was this, oh. the 15 years that you were there? Well, I lived off and on in New York City <gasps> ah, until moving to Illinois. It wasn't all in one? No, I moved there when I was 16, and I've wow. lived in Venezuela and Connecticut, Massachusetts, up and down the East Coast, done several sabbaticals in South Africa since then. So uh, I've lived a lot of places. I like to travel. Well, New York is certainly the place, uh, you know, if you wanted to be in movies at one time, you had to go to the West Coast. If you wanted to be a serious artist at one time, you had to go to New York City. So, Well, it's a self-selecting bunch of creative and dynamic and driven people. And the proximity to that kind of energy is hard to beat, but sure. it's exhausting. You sure. learn to say no if you want to get any work done. I see, because there's so much to capture your attention. Absolutely. And pull it elsewhere. Sure, and talented mm -hmm. and really interesting people that you can waste a coffee at a time oh, with. <laughs> right. Uh, you had mentioned that you had even tried your hand at portrait painting in New York City's Washington Square Park. How long did that gig last? Well, when I was 16, I thought I was moving to New York City to be an artist. So I thought, okay, how do I do that? And I used to go down to Washington Square Park and set up my painting set, my actually drawing set up, and I'd say, anybody want a portrait? And people would come by and they'd say, how much is it? And I'd say, pay what you think it's worth. And I'd do their portrait and they'd pay me what they thought it was worth. I was going to ask you what back then, what was the going rate for a genuine Nord home portrait? <laughs> well, but you left that flexible. Most people would give me like five, ten dollars, but one person gave me a hundred and that was a big day. Wow. For just a little sketch in the park. They must have liked your portrait. Uh, I guess. It wasn't caricature. I was doing what I thought of as, uh -huh. as a, a real attempt at a portrait. Okay. Getting the pastels was a big help in that regard. <laughs> well, I was going to ask it you. It wasn't this constant gig. It was just something I would do on Saturdays. My main job was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. When I came to New York, I said, well, where am I, if I have to work and I don't want to only waitress, where will I like right. to work? So right. I got a job at the Met, which was great because I got to haunt the halls and explore the storage rooms and meet all the curators. And Were you a guard or behind the scenes? Worked or? in the gift shop and then I worked in the Junior Museum. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I was going to ask you before, uh, what could you possibly say to somebody that maybe didn't think your portrait looked anything like them? Did you ever encounter? If they didn't like it, they didn't have to pay for it. It went into uh, my portfolio. Hey, <laughs> that's a good way to do it. It's, uh, you don't have to buy it. Uh, in your studio visit interview with Melissa Merling er, earlier this year, you mentioned that at one time you worked as a gallery director. Uh, when and where was that? Oh, let's see. Uh, that would have been after college. I went to uh, I went to Venezuela for about three years, and then I returned to uh, to the states, and that's when, with that advantage of that education, I was able to get uh, a job jobs as a gallery director. The gallery that I spent the most time at was on 57th Street. We represented an artist named Francisco Zuniga, who's the originator I, of the of the iconic. Uh, Latin American woman, right. a sculptor and also an extremely fine draftsman. And we also represented uh, Leonora Carrington and we sold second market, you know, Miro's and uh, various other people. Wow. And how long, how long did you do that for? Oh, for them, I don't know, a few years. Okay. And I was going to ask you, what insights did you take away from that experience in regard to the artist slash gallery relationship dynamic. I've always been fascinated by the relationship between the people that run the gallery and the artists who kind of need them to champion their work. Well, it was an odd time for me because here I am wearing my little suit up at 57th Street and at night I was 
wearing my filthiest clothes and renovating a loft on the Lower East Side and alternating with beaded Halston gowns that I got from models to go clubbing at Club 54. Okay. So, I mean, it was, and we were at the start then of the East Village uh, art scene, which was really exciting. We had all kinds of creative people and we do silly things like, um, like at Gracie Mansions, put up um, art in her little loo. You talked about the, an artist studio that you were filming in the other day. This was a space that was probably four foot by three foot. Wow. And yet we had Leo Castelli come through in a limousine at some point, and that was a thrilling day. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. just a burgeoning art scene. And we did all sorts of renegade art installations at places like the Navy Pier, and it was just wild and crazy. So I had that, that contrast between people who would try anything and had you know accessible prices and yet because of their verve you know it wasn't all Keith Haring and, and, and Jean-Michel Basquiat but they were there they were part of it and yeah. from that people like David Wanarovich who had a long and lasting impact Martin Wong I mean all sorts of really dynamic people that you've heard of and then a whole lot of us that you probably never heard of but we yeah. were also part of it well, it must have been an exciting time for It you. was. It was great. It sounds like you were almost leading a double life. I de indeed, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I used to try to clean the, the paint from my fingernails before I go in to show my Chagalls to clients. Oh, my <laughs> but I don't think they minded that. I think they liked the authenticity of the way I could speak about art. I right. think that I was able to make a connection selling art that I really believed in because I had the experience of trying to do some of these, tackling some of those right. issues with my own work. Well, that's part of what I wanted to ask you about. I mean, I, I kind of felt that you probably could bring more to the gallery experience because you are and were an artist of your, of your own right in those days. I like to think so, but I did leave kind of a trail of dust as I came into, the, into work every morning. <laughs> okay. Uh, you've used encaustic in your work. Can you explain to our viewers what is encaustic and what is it that you, why do you like to work in that medium? What are the pros and, and the cons and why do you like to use it? Well, when I left New York City, I came to ISU to do an MFA and um, I wasn't going to study painting with uh, what I used to call those old dogs because they didn't want them trying to tell me what to do and I had a, a notion of what I meant to do with my painting. Right. But I loved the opportunity to tackle sculpture. And I worked with a man named Dan Nardi who was tremendously talented and very kind man. And he initiated me into foundry work and welding and um, concepts of three-dimensional movement, which was, I could feel my brain tingling. I loved it. And I had done some sculpture in, in New York in my last days in my studio there. And I missed the, the grand scale of that, of that loft and nine foot paintings that I was able to do in that right. time. But having the opportunity to work hands on with, with heavy, rough stuff was a full body experience, which I really loved. And uh, that extended into installation work toward the end of my time there, which is a four year degree at ISU. It's a great blessing to have four years of studio and access right. to materials and the endorsement of being in a place where you never have to say to somebody, oh, what else do you do, you know? But at any rate, um, coming out of that uh, installation work, I moved into a small studio space and I said, well, okay, what do we do now? And I decided I'd tackle painting. But because I was so addicted to that textural um, material quality rather than representational light and, and space. I wanted to deal with actual things. And in caustic, although I'd never done it before, as a new medium, it allows you to, to carve into it and to mound it up. It's got, ah. you can stick stuff in it. This isn't even a very uh, deep space, but even in a piece like this, you can attach things to it and encrust it and uh, it's durable. It comes from uh, the earliest examples we have. It. I used to see all the time at the Met when I was working there. Their portraits, uh, Egyptian uh, 
portraits on tomb portraits that they right. did in encaustic, right. which are several thousand years old, and they're still intact and glorious color. And the base material is just beeswax. It's beeswax mixed with other waxes, depending on the hardness. You can uh, put in a, a dish of, of damar or carnauba, various other waxes, depending on the consistency. And then you mix it with pigment. And how do you... I have a pancake. Keep it flexible. I have a pancake griddle that I keep it melted on. That's amazing. And uh, to it, keep it I keep all pliable. my color there. Yes, you work it hot, and you you get it onto your board or your canvas or your substrate uh, as fast as you can, and then you use um, a flame or um, a heat gun to melt it, move it around. I you see. can scrape it off. Substrate is just the structure underneath that holds paper, the, metal, right, wood whatever. And then you can layer in things like collage or... Yep, I'm big on wood physical and physical el other elements. And, yes, all sorts of things. And in then, fact, my latest work is uh, done on... Uh, do I have an example here? No. Um, but I have... Uh, my latest work is done on metal. And uh, I paint... Uh, originally, I do a painting on the, on the computer. It printed out on metal. And then I scrape back in and add encaustic onto the surface of the metal. And you infuse the wax with color, some aspect of color to get, or is it yeah. different colored wax? No, well, wax itself comes from a bee. It doesn't come with color. So it comes with yellow, but it's a neutral, and then you add the pigment. That's correct. And and how do you do that? How do you add the pigment to it? Well, uh, I I have a, an assortment of powdered pigments that I ah. use that I dish in. Okay. Um, or occasionally, I've also got all my old oil paints, which I um, soak all the linseed oil out of, and right. then I use some of that. And that's wonderful because I still have some marvelous old colors that they don't manufacture anymore because they're right. too toxic. Interesting. I, so you're still currently working with encaustic. Yeah, I am. Okay. I love it. But I throw all sorts of stuff into my latest pieces. All right. Um, again, from your News Gazette article earlier this year, you talked about your work for the 2015 Boneyard Arts Festival. And you mentioned photographs entitled, Toys in Bad Places. <laughs> what could you tell us about that work? Well, um, my daughter and I enjoy exploring uh, old and abandoned places. And um, when you go into these, these buildings that have had a life, have had an identity, and they're completely encrusted, it's very visually stimulating. And yet there's a narrative there. There's a sense of the history of that space and who might have walked there. And uh, I went into a place that had been a school, and there were some toys lying around. And I, that, that concept of this having been a, a school where maybe a daycare center where little ones you know played and people wiped their noses and now it's a place that's <laughs> nothing but peeling lead paint and dust, asbestos dust you know and that sense of of uh, almost a an echo you know a, a ghostly echo of the life that those buildings had and if someone restores them, they can have them again, or right. they'll just be turned into landfill. Right. I like restoring houses, so it's something that resonates with me. And in fact, a lot of my recent work has come about because after having restored this house and very carefully removing all the old crap from it, right. I realized I missed it, that I was fond of it, and that I went back and scavenged some of the old hunks of wood and whatnot and began to incorporate them into my painting again. <laughs> Do you think that process was maybe the impetus for the beginning of this concept? Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. For example, in a piece like this where I've used all sorts of strange particle oh my board goodness. and I've created an assemblage that has, has definitely painted elements but it has bits of tar paper and cracked plaster and all. And the other thing that's great about encaustic is I can encapsulate things so I can collage in and attach them firmly and archivally, which is a, gives me a great freedom to, to work with all sorts of substances and materials. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were your uh, toys in bad places? What was the response to those photographs? I think people like them, but they don't necessarily want to live with them. <laughs> right. I think they're, uh, they're art for art's sake, and to, to some degree. It, 
only a few people have wanted that in their home, and it's been fun making that connection with people that enjoy the same sort of resonance that I enjoy. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly enigma um, to those images, and I suppose, depending upon the type of personality you have, you could maybe read uh, emptiness or loneliness or something into them uh, rather than a... There's certainly a, a, a sense of emotional uh, pain that's in, involved right. in those images. Right, I enjoyed that, but not everybody probably would. So that, <laughs> that's why I was curious about the feedback that you that you got about those. Well, there's certainly a great contrast to the kinds of photographs I was taking uh, back in my Yale days. <laughs> what were these, those like? These lustrous, perfect nudes. Ah. Although uh, later some of the emulsion cracked and I, I enjoyed the texture that that gave those images too. Right. Well, Christina, thanks for inviting us into your studio today. Do you have any last thoughts or comments you might want to share with us about your work? I mean, what you're currently working on, for example? I guess, I guess there is one thing I'd like to say, and that is that... This is your chance. That uh, <laughs> don't tell yourself no. Tell yourself why not and pursue it. I think that it may lead to avenues that you don't choose to follow up on, but you'll never discover what your limits are unless you push them. Oh, that's good advice, not only for an artist, but I think for all of us. So Good. Uh, our guest today has been Christina Nordholm. You can learn more about her work at cnordholmart.com. That's her webpage. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Art Now. And I also hope that it might encourage you to explore further our local art scene and perhaps even inspire you to create your own art now. <laughs>